Yeah, it was a niche on that year. Rose Bowl. Yeah. Was it, yeah. it was <laughs> often easier for us non philosophers to like accept it and read it because we had no baggage. Mm. To that's to that's how I'm feeling and, too. And, 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 uh, I'm we not had a less baggage to carry. Yeah. And we found that the philosophers were really grappling with it because they'd been trained in certain disciplines or, you know, they they gone through graduate programs with you know, and, and adhere to certain, uh, and they just like you were. It's like, oh, where Grappling. does it fit in my yeah. worldview, or how can I unpacking that? Right, mm -hmm. and that it it was really difficult. And every that question it, begets a question. And and, and I think we really saw that too. I was That's in an NEH, the arc China, the arcs have changed the real and the ideal in two thousand and seven. It was directed by Roger Ames, and 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 half of the group was philosophers, and you know the history majors, the English majors, mm -hmm. well English. We're used to kind of setting aside, or, you know, suspending our disbelief, or is this, and then we can accept everything and live it, and that kind of thing. But the my, my, <laughs> my brain, <laughs> my brain was hurting <laughs> when I was, you know. And we're, and we're like, brain was my brain was on overload. I know. I was like, I felt like my chihuahuas when they get, you know, <laughs> overwhelmed. <laughs> they get scared. They're like, that's how I felt. He's trying to answer the philosophers. So you have to be one jump ahead of their questions. Their questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how are you Are we all bad? Yeah. No, I don't think. Oh, when I read this, I don't see it as. I don't see this challenging to me. Oh, it is challenging to my worldview, but not not in the sense of like because of all these preconceived notions or whatever. It's just. I, I, I think, you just as I read it, it's, it's, I mean, it's beautifully written, it's and it makes world. perfect sense, right? But then, but then in, in struggling to understand, so like if, I'm, if I am going to say that, let it be its own work, right? I'm trying to understand its orientation, and maybe because of its like cultural or its historical context, I'm having that difficulty, but also there isn't anything leading me to that, and that I think it speaks back to where you started from, which was that we don't know where the book came from, there is no, like, but also it has Did to do with language, language which you discussed in the beginning, yeah. you know, yeah. that it's oh. uh, eventful rather than essential, you know what I mean? So that's a whole different it is. approach. It is, a, it is a different way of being in the world. Yeah. Don, Donna, do you remember that text that we had to read for the, um, the summer program two years ago that looks at kind of Eastern ways of thinking and Western ways of existing in the world? I can't draw a blank on it, but reading that before reading the Analects really kind of helped situate me in this whole idea of kind of relational. <laughs> one of the, it um, was one of the, the it was one of the texts. The reading. The readings that, that Peter blank. assigned, um, and and I can't think of the actual name. That might be for some people. But it, you know, it was it's the idea of, as 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 is in here, the gerund, the ing, the yeah. the, the, the noun, <coughs> and that for me is really. Helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of the language for me. Yes. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we, I think, we mentioned in, the, in our introduction, we even got ungrammatical in English a couple of times mm -hmm. in order to try to convey the sense of the Chinese. That the ruler, ruler, the minister, minister, the father, father, the son, the son. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the best way to read the Chinese. It's yeah. the same parallelism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, the, the nouns to, to verbs. Well, I actually had a question about that, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, on, sure. Um, it's 9-4. Yeah. And there are four things the master abstained from entirely. That one, he did not speculate that claim or demand certainty. So I was looking at the Chinese above it. And the one, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh character looked to me like Jin or heart-mind. It is with one extra character. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. it's yeah. That makes the word means, it means must. Or oh, didn't. Oh, yeah. how interesting yeah. that is. Because yeah. then I was thinking, oh, well, you just can't translate the, the concept directly, you know. But no, yeah, no, no, that, that is a different. Okay. The one stroke, you're close, aren't mine. It's only one stroke away. Right. It's yeah. five strokes instead of four. Right. <laughs> That's hard line. Um, well, this is lovely. I'm enjoying myself immensely. I hope this is of some value to, to you as well. It, it is a different way of being in the world. <coughs> of addressing the world, and this is something else that you might find useful to your students, but I, you know, because that was what well, I know I'm an individual, he just seems to be kind of missing that. Um, ask your student, tell me who you are 
uniquely. What makes you who you are? It makes that no one else in the world is just like you. And the immigration officer says, what's your nationality? I say, American. What's your voting preference? Democrat, leading to socialist. <laughs> but uh, you know, this, what's your race? Caucasian. What's your favorite baby? What, what kind of Cub fan? Are you a Cub fan? Yes, I'm a Cub fan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So you're a pessimist. Like, <laughs> so you're a pessimist. <laughs> no, eternal optimism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm an Indian fan. There you That's go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For a while, it was us and the Red Sox fans. Yeah, yeah. Really. So their optimism has finally been uh, <laughs> justified. Uh, the rest of us are still hanging still in there. Becoming. <laughs> still becoming. Yeah, yeah, a prominent mal malaise. But what makes me unlike absolutely anyone else? And try it for yourself. There is something, I don't know whether to call it psychological or biological, genetic, but I do have a sense where there is no one just like me. Do you know Can the I poem by Auden, The Unknown Citizen? No. You know that poem? No. By the Rich Auden? No. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's statistics, your number, you know, everything that's on paper, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with who you are. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, yeah. 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 Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, um, it, you will find, if you try it yourself, it is very difficult to do, if not impossible. But I say, well, my memory makes me who I am. Yeah. Sure. Does that mean you're somebody else when you get Alzheimer's? <laughs> when you get amnesia? What about people who are capable of a large amount of self-deception? That's a very unusual construct. We dislike deceivers, we feel sorry for the deceived. What's the proper emotion with the same person? <laughs> In both there. And if sometimes things that people say about themselves are clearly not true, i.e. strong cases of self-deception, it follows that people can't be who they say they can't be who they say they are. So who am I then? Now I, I, we don't have too much more time today because I could just get you really wiggling your backsides on the chair, <laughs> trying to come up with an answer that specified you from anyone else. There is an easy way to do it. I'm the oldest son of Henry and Sally Rosemont, and have been for all of my almost 80 years. Two-thirds of that time I've been the husband of Joanne Roswell. I've been the father of our five daughters. I've been the teacher of so many students. I've been the student of so many teachers. A friend of friend, neighbor of neighbor, colleague of colleague. And you put all those together, it's Henry Rosemont. Huh. Wow. I never thought of it that way before. Sounds very Confucian. <laughs> 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 it took our girls a while to realize they were raised as confused. They weren't raised as confused. <laughs> <coughs> this suggests that at least a hint of an argument in favor of seeing human beings relationally yeah. rather than as individuals. And I alone and afraid in a world I never made the houseman poem. Just frightened confused. You wouldn't understand that either. My goodness, what a life you must have led <laughs> to have that feeling. Or and of course that's where the, the, the little argument I was giving from John Stuart Mill. When you see yourself as a web of relations, you will realize that you are encumbered. Mm -hmm. You are not free to do what you like. Mm -hmm. Only within constraints. You must have a certain amount of autonomy, but not in the sense of cut off from others. You must have leeway in figuring out what's the most appropriate thing to do with this person now and be able to do it. That's what, with the freedom, that's where freedom and autonomy would come in. There, okay, uh, right there. I have to be able to figure out on my own what it is I should do in this specific situation with my friend Donna. Not with Gail, but with Donna. I don't know Gail more very well yet, so I might have to do more guessing on what the most appropriate thing is. 
but I have to be able to figure out what I think is the best, most appropriate thing to do with Donna. And then, of course, I must have freedom in the sense of being able to do it. That's a different kind of freedom than being able to choose on your own, cut off from other considerations. Very, very different. The notion of an individual or individualism in there. So that's, if you will, that's Rogers. Been Rogers and my major hobby horse now for some time. But we're related, interrelated species, and we don't play our roles. We live them. So when all my roles have been specified and their interrelations made clear, that also has to come in. That is, I'm not simply Samantha's father to Samantha when she's young. I'm Samantha's father to her teachers, to her playmates, yeah. and later her husband, and then her children. So you know, all those kind of webs have to be woven. <coughs> and I'm just still trying to answer, in part, Carlos's question, why is this so appealing? Because that's the way we live. <laughs> this is who we are, in a sense. And he's calling attention to it, in a way. And if you will, building a way of life, rounding it in experience in that way. And that's why I say that the best way to see the Chinese philosophy as different from Western is in the form, the former is analytic, describing experiences, every day, day in and day out experiences, and normatively addressing, here is a, a decent way of interacting with your grandmother. It's not the way you should interact with your younger sister, on most occasions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there will be something maximally appropriate, though, for you as a specific person, with all your strengths and weaknesses, to do with that specific other person. So paradoxically, in this system, we all are truly individuals. You aren't the sum of any numbers. I have to know you well enough to figure out what's most appropriate. A number of feminist think philosophers have also been making that case. I must hide you know, any in particularity you have in trying to figure out what's the best universal rule to make up or what will maximize uh, benefits for all or things like that. It's, it's the very notion of having, you can't negotiate either. That is, there will be times, at least in a modern Confucianism, maybe the most appropriate thing we do at first is, what would you like me to do, dear? <laughs> That's the other way they think you can do most usefully with respect to their situation at that time. And these, I say, are just, you know, they're everyday life, but they're kind of powerful for, for all that. So that's what's going on in the book. And the quicker you can get you know, your own students to kind of pick up on that, to try to appreciate this is a very different way of being in the world. I also think, normatively now myself, it's very badly needed today. I mean, yeah. We're getting moral individualism about that. Well, whatever. Yeah. Whatever becomes the word, you know, the kids think, who am I to say you shouldn't do that? That's just, you know, my, uh, a kind of thing. No, we're not. Um, so there are a, a large number of implications of, of, of this orientation. Going back to the eventful languages, it's also the idea of correlating not only behaviors on the part of people who are interrelated, but correlating events with respect to time. That's the way the Chinese science is run, on the basis of time. And uh, now here I'm borrowing from a, a dear old friend, Nathan Sivan, a grand historian of Chinese science and medicine. And he has argued very, very cogently that both in China and the West, of course, people have been puzzled by how is it, on the one hand, that things are constantly changing, and yet we're not astounded when we wake up in the morning, i.e. nature tends to conform to itself. How is it possible to daily see changes all around us, on the other hand, see nature conforming to itself? So in the West, the tendency was to postulate some underlying essence, 
some reality underlying the appearances which was unchanging. The appearances could change, the reality didn't. Appearance, reality, substance, qualities, other issues of grammar, maybe. You know, Spinoza wouldn't like to be told that, even though it must very probably be true. <laughs> <coughs> Whereas what the Chinese did it in terms of time. And, uh, so you see when they would do things like doing astronomy, you have one circle here and the needle's pointing straight up. It goes around once, it's 24 hours, that's one day. Bigger circle goes around 30 days before they're both up here, one month. Another one, 360 <coughs> days. I bet you thought there were 365, didn't you? Really only 360, that's good Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> you get the circles again. <coughs> After they discover Jupiter, big circle every 14 years before all the needles are pointing at noon at the same time. There are ways of correlating things with respect to time. That's what it is. Because the fundamental cosmological principle of Chinese thought is the only constant is change. From its oldest and most revered book, the I Ching, that's the message. And the near opposite of change in, in Chinese thought is stagnation. Not states that the stability, but stagnation. Not change is bad news. And in a sense, that's good news because we are always changing. <laughs> we are. <clears throat> I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not like the woman I used to be. It's quite literally true. It's not just an, a lament on the aging process, it's quite literally true of all of us. And again, it's the world of experience. Young friends become old friends. Those chat changes us. You get married, you're changed. You become a parent, you're changed in very fundamental ways. If you think long and hard about it, without thinking, sometimes you even change the tone of your voice depending on who you're talking to and when. And the words you use can change. So, what then is constant about you? What is un what's the underlying reality? Well, maybe that's not the way. To, that's not what you should be looking for. It's the events that together make up life. Just like there are, there is no one strand of rope that goes through an entire. Corded, piece of cordage, they're just overlapping. And I think that's this, the Kishtai again, family resemblances. Family resemblances. This has, and I've, I've uh, really pushed a lot uh, on this today, and, and I'm glad you've been with me 110% of the way, because there are other, I mean, you seem to be very, you feel good now with the eth a lot of the ethical implications of this. It doesn't mean that, well, what it does mean is there is no answer to the question of abortion, for example. You're not going to find one here. Obviously, the only people who can answer a question like that are the mother to be, perhaps her family, perhaps the father to be. And it'll differ from time to time and person to person. When is euthanasia okay? Grand Uncle Tommy over here, the family gathers, keep them going. Grand Uncle Jimmy over here in the other ICU room, he doesn't feel the thing, hasn't for a long time, it might seem to be twitchy. Maybe it's time to pull the plug. But there's no, no law to make things like that. That's very intensely personal, without being relativistic. That's a strange combination. This is a form of particularity. Now, there is a, the big generalization, you are always to do what is maximally appropriate <coughs> to contribute to the flourishing of the other with whom you're interacting. 
What should I do? Oh, what do you think you should do? <laughs> <laughs> it is thrown on us. So it's not, you know, these are not dictates from on high. It's not simply rule following. It's got to bend the rules. You know, we make an arrangement. Joanne cooks Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I cook Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And she has a very bad Monday. She says, will you cook tonight? And I say, no, it's not my night. <laughs> <laughs> then the marriage is starting to get in trouble. <laughs> Um, but there are also a number of political implications uh, to this kind of orientation of interrelatedness and living in terms of roles and relations rather than living as individuals. Um, and we'll take up some of those to, well, just, just very quickly. The, Taliban, as, as far as I know, have not killed anyone's sons or daughters among the American <coughs> people. They've killed only infidels, imperialists, and things like that. Just like all we've done is kill Haji Baba terrorists. We've not killed anybody's son or daughter, or husband or wife. We haven't killed any grandmothers. Collateral damage means grandmothers and babies. And you talk like that. <coughs> It's a little hard to conduct a war. What was the body count last week in the Vietnam center? How many grandmothers were killed? Very different. Think of making laws that apply more to families. Think of how families might be reconstituted by governments in ways that were not sexist but supporting and we really have to think about those things. Families have been in the hands of the right wing now, family values, for about 75 years. The left has simply abandoned the family, which is crazy, because families aren't going to go away. So they're going to have either more dysfunctional ones, or we can make better ones. And I certainly don't trust the conservatives any longer to make better ones. <laughs> but there are ways of uh, doing that. And there's the politics. Most importantly, I think, uh, for your purposes, for your own purposes, however much you do or do not want to do these with your students, is what this means for um, your religious life. Your religious life. Uh, living an interrelated, seeing yourself as an interrelated human being. It'll give you insights, I think, into things like ancestor veneration among the Chinese that you might understand in a different way than you have up to this point. I want to touch on that uh, tomorrow. And whatever else you want, I'd like to use the last 15 minutes of today to uh, get not the poem, not the analect that you've memorized, or um, <coughs> To make up your own. I would like to get the ones that you found puzzling or wrong uh, that you didn't get <laughs> over that part of the assignment. I'll go over those for a while. So if I can't answer them intelligently now, I'll be ready first thing <laughs> to, uh, to, to help you uh, with them. But um, who had, uh, who would like to give me an analyst that you didn't like uh, or didn't understand? And I'll warn you about the one you didn't like. The New English teachers will love this the best. Uh, when the student evaluations first came out, um, they started at Berkeley a long time ago when I was a graduate student. That is a very long time ago. They did quickly spread to all other campuses, and they started becoming mandatory fairly early on. And Columbia, when Columbia first implemented them, there was a fair, a fair amount of compliance. This was immediately after the Columbia blew up, the Mark Webb things and so on. And one of the most uh, more distinguished professors of English uh, said, no, he wouldn't, wouldn't do that. He wouldn't use the test. And I don't know which of the more distinguished professors of English at Columbia at the time, who, who it was, but there were a number of them. <laughs> and they said, well, you have to. 
so that the decide they reach a compromise. He could make up the questions, and then they would go accordingly. So the first question from his test was, which of the readings in this course did you like the most? That was professor of Literature. Second question is, which of these readings did you dislike the most? Third question is, to what defect in your character do you attribute that decision? <laughs> 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 uh, always love that one. <laughs> so now, who would like to tell me that I dislike? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Yes. I, this is a passage that I like, but I don't understand. So it's um, 9.17. And is it you? Mm. And I've been interested in, in parts of the Analect where Confucius talks about nature, whether he talks about mountains oh, yeah. or water. And so this one, the master was standing on the riverbank and observed, isn't life's passing just like this, never ceasing day or night? Yeah. Is, is that related to what you were talking about, that this Chinese notion that the only constant is change? Only constant is change. And it's just no matter what, there is something that seems to be at least in part cross-cultural about that. That's that there are famous poets or philosophers I mean, almost every culture is one of the, the best places and best ways and methods contemplating death without becoming morbid about it is by water. Either sitting in a riverside or watching the waves at the ocean or things like that. There's something eternal that gives a sense of eternity or eternality that uh, not necessarily you know, for an immortal soul, it's just there. So why am I so worried about the fact that I've passed from the scene? Um, and life's passing. It, I think there are a number of possible good readings for that, that never ceasing day or night, because it isn't. We are getting old when we're sleeping as well as when we're awake. Um, and I, at least I have found, and I suspect some of the other, you're all much younger than I am, with some maybe a little closer than others, you'll find the years go by quicker as you get older. Uh, sometimes it seems to take a long time to go from 23 to 24. From 64 to 65 takes about a minute and a half. <laughs> um, and all, he, this, this is a, a meditative. Um, it's one of Roger's, Roger Ames' uh, favorites in there. Um, and, and of course, it seems a little uh, Heraclitan as well, the, the idea of the change uh, <coughs> just going on. It, and it doesn't. It doesn't not have, I don't want to say a purpose, but you see, when you just still think like that, you don't think, well, what's the purpose of it? You can explain why it is, you know, the mountain, ice is melted from the mountains in the spring or whatever, but we ask, why? Why does the water just keep flowing like this? It's probably not the right question to ask. Um, you never. Supposedly, the place where he, the, the river he was looking at near his city of his birth is in Nishan. You know, was looking out from that little overlook down, Donna was uh, with Joanne and I and a number of other her colleagues in Nishan, the birthplace of Confu the supposed birthplace of Confucius. I don't believe for a minute he was born in that cave, uh, <laughs> but it's great for publicity and tourism and things like that. I crush no eagle and no <laughs> no. <laughs> um, there is just, did anybody read that differently, or how did anybody else anybody else want to comment on that? What? You know, it, when I read that, I'm reminded of the other one, and I, I couldn't find it because I don't know the number, about the one with the North Star. Mm -hmm. That, you know, there are, there are <coughs> times where it's important, life is changing all the time, but, you know, an exemplary person with exemplary conduct is a yeah. North Star, an unchanging point for others. Um, so it's a nice... He, as you said, he uses a lot of images that can be... Th that's true. And it, it's the idea of... Uh, the other thing to, just reminded me of the way Donna put her point was 
The constancy is the constant change. It is Friday, and it looks just <coughs> like Thursday, yeah. but the, and the river does, but it obviously isn't. It is very different. But that's a nice, there aren't too many of those, you picked up on one of the few, where he's clearly being a contemplative. Yeah. Is himself. He's usually much more other directed in here, he's just, hmm. Right, and, yes. and it's so opposite to the one that follows, yeah. you um, know? Uh, I have yet to meet the person who is fonder of excellence than of physical beauty. Uh, one is so philosophical, the other is so, I don't know what the word would be, um, <coughs> realistic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Attending to the world of our experience. Yeah. Yeah. He is very practical. Yeah, very yes. practical. Yeah. 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 Yes. I have a question about um, on 923. Um, that I, I, you know, the, the master said the young should be held in high esteem and after all, how do we know that those yet to come will not surpass our contemporaries, which is, well, makes a lot of sense to me. It is only when one reaches 40 or 50 years of age and yet has done nothing of note. That and was so very depressing. What <laughs> is that nothing of note, right, that we should withhold our esteem? So it feels to me that, you know, um, I, I wonder what that nothing of note is, because it seems like when you reach a certain age, you, you know, how is that interpreted? There's another one like that too, but yeah. something about turning 40 and it's hopeless. Life is <laughs> over, yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious I, about... I'm sorry. Is that right? you, you actually said something about that, in the, I think in the introduction, the transcript introduction mm -hmm. about how in old age he had, he sort of started feeling like he had not accomplished. Oh, yeah, yeah. he almost certainly thought he was right. a failure when he died. But he... <coughs> remember, He's speaking largely about people who are living in villages. Oh, okay. yeah. And what that means is the odds are that you would have developed a reputation as a good person fairly early on. But if you weren't known for being a stalwart son or an excellent mother or a dutiful daughter-in-law or things like that by the time you were 40, if you're just mediocre at those things, it doesn't mean tenure job at Harvard. I was going to say that's a very. It's. It, I'm looking at it from such a Western point of view because you know when you reach a certain age, you've established more, and 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 so it's so interesting because I'm looking at it completely from that sense of, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's not an accomplishment. Yeah. It's like being. It, so. It's well. <clears throat> no, for good. That's a. Yes, from the Western sense, you said it just right. <laughs> yes. But Roger and I prefer always to say becoming. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There are no human beings, there are only human, human becoming. Becomes, right. They're always becoming right. something uh, yeah. something new or something different. Uh, but, you know, it is that to be worthy of esteem for, uh, and Roger and I chose that one, one that, term, that term carefully, there are two or three other terms in that English that might work for that Chinese, yeah. is that. and. Yeah, he is really good to his children. She is just outstanding in the work that she does. Yeah. Um, is, is commendable, seen as an exemplar of at least one quality is what we can kind of shoot for. You'll see there is a, um, there are a number of heroes in, in, in this book and in others people who exemplified a particular way of, of, of acting in, in the world. Sometimes they are in conflict with each other. There is, I guess we can finish on this one, it gets a little bit into the politics, but this, the esteem here does mean exemplary in some sense of the way they have lived their interrelated life with others. It doesn't mean tenure professorship right. at Harvard, even though every American academic is going to see it that way, including me the first few times I've read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if, if, you, if you say, well, who was king when? Oh, well, he is a legendary sage king. The word when now means literature, it means polish, it means... It was kind of like an X mark. The first embellishments on pieces of pottery is what it's originally a, a, a stylized picture of. 
but it means culture, literature, things like that. And he's known as, uh, he is a, a sage king because he, the last Shang dynasty king, the dynasty of the Zhou, uh, the, the last emperor was just hell on wheels in terms of uh, no good a type of person. And King Wen kept remonstrating with him. Change your ways, King. Change your ways, King. Stop burdening the people. Stop overtaxing them. Stop building so many pleasure palaces. Stop, 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 stop. And the emperor just kept saying, you know, go away. I'm going to get mad at you, or worse. Uh, it, it was brave in doing it. He kept remonstrating. So he's known as being a loyal remonstrator, and he's become a sage king for that. He had a son named King Wu. And Wu is the word, one of the words for martial, military. He is a sage king, a model for future generations, because he overthrew the last Shang Emperor and established the Zhou Dynasty in his father's name. And it was the longest lived lived dynasty in all of Chinese history. So, wait a minute! <laughs> How can we like these two? Is there no consistent rule? Okay. Now, when you think about that for politics, but also when you think about it, it also will relate to the family. Okay, I know I should be a loyal daughter, I should do this and that, but suppose my father's abusive. Huh. I play the game, but he doesn't. Or I live my role, but he doesn't live his role. What does Confucius say about it? The first thing you have to think about, wait a minute, am I asking for, for, asking for a principle? when I know he's not going to give me one. Yeah. And so, well then, what kind of, is that, why the book then, if you can't answer questions like that? He can. The first thing he'll say is, well, this, never mind the abuse. But, well, first thing of all, have you no hint of what you might do with respect to your abusive father? And you're going to ask me, an old philosopher, what you should do? No. It's easier to think about in the first instance if you think about serving a bad ruler. That's usually where the question comes from. It's not abusive father. It's what happens if you, every Confucianist should serve if called upon to participate in government. So what happens if you're serving a world class SOB? What do you do? And Confucius, there is no general answer. You first ask, is this emperor reformable? This one, not emperors in general. <coughs> Most rulers have been losers from time immemorial in every civilization. <laughs> right? This one, this one I am serving, is he capable of redemption? If the answer is yes, you then ask a second question, do I have the capacity to reform him? Huh. Are my skills such that I might that might be persuasive. Does he like me? Do I have enough respect for him, if not affection, that I can serve him with a straight face? And I ask, keep asking that. And if I answer that question, yes, King Wen becomes my model. I do have a model to follow. The sage King Wen, who continues to remonstrate with courage toward the ruler. If the answer to the first question is yes, the ruler, I do believe he is reformable on the basis of my knowledge of him, but I can't do it. I'm too quick-tempered. I'll blow it, I know. Then I have another model, Confucius. He was out of office, went home. He's, you can serve government that way too, he was very careful to point out. I can put my own house in order, my own village in order, and that too is serving the government if I can't get anything done at court. If the answer to the first question is no, he's not reformable, King Wu becomes my model. I try to overthrow him. There's always an answer. <laughs> okay? But it has to be for each person in each situation. It's the same with your father. It may be, well, you should call 911. But that's not the first thing you do. Did, have I contributed at all to this? I don't know. What, what is it? Is it because he's lost his job or what? And if I can't do anything about it, can I help my kid brothers and sisters do something about it? 
if that fails, can I protect my kid brothers and sisters from what he's about? Or in the end, just tell them if you bother mother or else what's more, I'm calling 911. That's what it might come to. But again, how do you legislate in advance what to do with those kind of things? But there is always an answer. Look to the others in this situation, look to your own strengths and weaknesses, and come up with an assessment of appropriateness.